Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 207. I am one with the Force, and the Force is one with me. Shirut, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble Jedi host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Video Blocks. Now, guys, when I was shooting my show for Legendary Pictures, uh, and I did that 96 pages in four days, I actually got into post and we used a lot of stock footage, stock sounds, and even some uh, graphics from Video Blocks. They are an amazing resource. With your membership, you are granted the rights to use that footage forever in perpetuity on any projects you want to. So if you want to try a seven-day free trial, and by the way, anything you download during those seven days is yours to keep. And if you decide to stay, you get 84% off the yearly membership. It is well worth it, guys. Trust me, if you do a lot of production, it is something you really need. So just head over to videoblocks.com forward slash hustle. Well, if any of you guys have been listening to me for the last two and a half years, you guys know I am a big Star Wars fan. So this is Star Wars Week at Indie Film Hustle. I'm going to be releasing new posts and uh, blog posts about stuff going on with Star Wars and how it affects us as indie filmmakers. And today we are going to release a special episode. And it is an episode with my good buddy, one of my best friends in the whole world, Dan Cregan, who is a VFX guru or slash Jedi. And uh, he worked on not only Rogue One at ILM, but he also just finished working on The Last Jedi. And I wanted to, I haven't had him on. He was number episode number six of the original time he was on the podcast. And uh, he's one of the rare re-invites to come back. And it's been almost two, over 200 episodes since he's been here. And I wanted to, uh, to dig in. He's been very busy. He's worked on a lot of big movies over the course of the last couple of years. And I really wanted to dig in on what it's like to work at ILM, what their workflow is like, what VFX are like, uh, working at that high level, and advice for VFX artists, advice for filmmakers on how to deal with VFX artists. And we also geek out a little bit, as you know we would. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with VFX Jedi Dan Cregan. I'd like to welcome back onto the show returning champion Dan Cregan. What's up, brother? <laughs> How's it going? Dan, you are my, you were, I think, my first or second interview. You know, you were episode, you were episode yeah. six. Oh, first. You were episode yeah. six, but you were one of my first uh, actual interviews, not just me yapping. Uh, so <laughs> um, it's been uh, over 200 episodes since then. <laughs> wow. So it's insane, brother. So thanks for coming back. And uh, you've been busy. So this little thing you're doing, it, it might be taking off a little bit, you know, it's, just a little bit. It's, it's, you know what? It's helping a lot of filmmakers and a lot of uh, artists out there. And that's that's the goal and what I do with Indie Film Hustle. But yeah, it is. It's taken up more of my time than it did back when I recorded <laughs> with you originally. <laughs> and you've been semi busy as well. Uh, as well, a little bit. Over the a last, little bit. Over the last couple of years. Last, last we heard. You were working your your big movie you had been, just finished was Guardians of the Galaxy um, and The Hobbit, uh, but since then you have um, what, you finally got to Mecca, which is for all visual effects artists, Industrial Light and Magic. And uh, I wanted to bring you on the show because this week The Last Jedi gets released, and uh, I have an inside friend who was there while making it. You help make the movie and has yet and has uh, from what you told me seen it at least 20 times we would be <laughs> by the way no spoilers at all so don't worry about spoilers for the movie um but before we even get to last jedi as long as i've known you you've always wanted to work at ilm uh industrial light and magic for anybody who doesn't know what that is and what is it finally what was it like finally getting to like walk through those hallowed halls and work well, it it was very surreal. I mean, maybe that's an overused thing to say. Oh, this was surreal, but it was surreal in in the very definition of the word. Word, um, you know, I was lucky for one. I got to work in ILM San Francisco. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not, you know, not to say anything against the other branches because there's one in, in Vancouver, there's one in London, there's one in Singapore. Mm -hmm. But um, 
you know, San Francisco is where it all started. That's where the original players still are. You know, that's where the history is. Even though they're not in their original building, the Presidio has got a lot of history in it mm-hmm. since I think it, they started episode three at the Presidio. Mm-hmm. So like 2005. Um, and so, but all the old props are there and it's like walking through a film museum every day and all the original posters. And I've seen 95% of all these films on the wall. And, you know, and it's funny because, um, a lot of the younger artists will be giving tours to their family and friends to the, through the facility. And, and they don't know so many of these movies that I grew up on that are on these walls. And I, and I always <laughs> had to bite my tongue and try not to interject with, uh, you don't know what that is. This is so-and-so, or this is in something else, you know? So it was, um, it was like being home, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I'm an East coaster, you know, I'm from South Florida, mm-hmm. like you, I, I, I hate to remind you of that. But, I yeah. am. I am. <laughs> so, but you know, but I felt very at home in, in that place, maybe not in San Francisco as a whole, but, but when I was at work there, it just felt like where I belonged because everywhere I looked was a piece of film history, things that I've obsessed about and thought about and probably given way too much time thinking about for that matter. <laughs> and just being able to walk through those halls and, 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 you know, walk and, and see directors come and go. And, and, and sometimes actors get tours and, and they come and they give speeches and man, and there's nothing like it. I mean, I, I dreamed of being in the film business and this was the epitome of being in the film business, you know? Yeah. And I wish I would have taken you up on the offer to fly up to San Francisco and take that tour. <laughs> I, I really do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that you get another gig there soon so I can actually just jump on a plane for a day and go up there and, 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 and take the tour. It was just hard co- talking to my wife about it. I'm like, babe, I'm just going to jump on a plane and go up and tour ILM for, with Dan for a day. And she's like, "What? Are you, how old are you? I'm like, oh, I know. I know. Oh, you would have been taking the selfie with the Yoda fountain and R2. And oh, I would have made it an entire event. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and the tribe would have would have thanked me for it. But uh, maybe next time. I'm sure you'll get called back. Um, so the first movie you worked on uh, at ILM was uh, Star Wars Rogue One, which was your first Star Wars film. It was, and, and arguably one of the best in the in the entire saga, in my opinion. I, I loved it. What did you think of it? Uh, I am really fond of it. Um, I, I, you know, it's funny. I there's a lot of things about it that I love even more than Force Awakens, as far as it feels so tied to the original trilogy I grew up in, and 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 having Vader in it. And everybody's like, not only do you have Vader in your movie, you have the Vader scene that now people maybe consider the greatest Vader scene in all of star Wars. Mm -hmm. And so it's just cool to have my name on, on the credit roll of that film. And, and, um, you know, I overall think the movie was a a tremendous success. I I think the last 40 minutes are where it really sings. I think the last 40 minutes of that film are just perfection. I think there's, there's a little too much like planet hopping in the, in the first half. And I, I think it's like just a little confusing and it doesn't find its rhythm, but once it does, I think the thing is absolutely just as strong as they come. Now, uh, you know, whenever anybody asks me about any film I've worked on, I always have to stipulate that I don't have a clear vision of it because when I was working on rogue one, I watched it in pieces, the same as I did later with last Jedi. I, I just kind of, um, I, I saw most of the uh, film before I saw it in theaters and I saw it out of continuity, out of order. And I saw it evolve and, and have different versions and, and you just tend to love it. I mean, when I saw the Vader hallway scene, um, before, <laughs> you know, anybody else, I, I jumped out of my desk, you know, I was like, Whoa, you know, and, and, and the Leia ending, I said, Whoa, this is crazy. We're really doing this. And, and, <laughs> and all those things were amazing, even though I didn't get to work on those shots, you know? Right. So it was amazing just to have, to be a part of the team and see those things. And now that everybody's seen them, you know, I couldn't talk about them. I can't, you know, you know, I signed so many uh, legal documents and, and nobody wants to hear about it before it comes out anyway. I would be right. spoiling the fun. So right. um, when I when I do finally watch it, I have the added baggage of any film I work on. I have the added baggage of knowing how it came to be, which not it doesn't ruin my enjoyment of a film, but it definitely taints it in a certain way to where I can't give a 100 percent clear review of something that I enjoy it. Now I have so many friends who are star Wars fans and they, and they were all talking to me, Oh, it's the best since empire. And it's amazing. And I love it more than, than, you know, anything that's come out in star Wars since the original trilogy. And, 
you know, so I've heard a lot of that and I, and I love that I've been a part of it, but to me, there's, there's a slight difference when you're, when you're behind the curtain and you see all the pieces come together. It, it takes away a little of your uh, objectivity. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So that's the cost. The cost of achieving your dream of working on on your childhood fantasies is that you do put a little dent in those fantasies. At least uh, you can't enjoy the new ones as a fan. And 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 that being said, when Force Awakens came out, it actually was the other way around. I hadn't worked on it, but I had friends who worked on it, and I was jealous. I was so <laughs> jealous, and it ruined the film a little bit for me because all I could think about was I wanted that job so bad. And I didn't make it. And now here it is. And now Han Solo's dead. And I'll never Rush, get no, no one. Dead. People in Ireland have seen it. Shush. <laughs> a Force Awakens has been out for how long? Two it, years? Okay. I, that's, you know what? If, if, if whoever's listening has not seen Force Awakens yet and you're a Star Wars fan, I'm sorry. Sorry. It's just. If you're a Star Wars fan and you haven't seen The Force Awakens, then there's something wrong. That, at, that, <laughs> at that point in the game, there's something wrong. And I remember yeah. you telling me. After Rogue One came out, that you literally had because you on in your computer, you can uh, at your workstation, you can bring up any sequence you want, right? In yeah, the in the data correct. in the uh, off the hard drives, um, and you would literally have the, the, the Vader stuff on loop, right? <laughs> Constantly, yeah, I did, and sometimes fellow artists who are working on other films that are sitting around, you don't want to be subjected to that either. They're like, "Don't show me, don't talk to me, don't tell me, I don't want to hear it." I, <laughs> It's so hard to save spoiler free when you're when you're working on a film, and uh, you know, but we have access to all the dailies. One of, that's one of the advantages of being at ILM is that sometimes, uh, same as when I was at Weta working on The Hobbit, you have mm-hmm. access to the whole film. A lot of times when you're at the smaller VFX houses, you only have access to the part of the film you're working on. Like right. when I was working on Spectre, a James Bond movie, I would have loved to have spoiled the whole thing for myself, but we only had access to the mountain chase scene that I worked on, and. And that was better. So if I get to work on a small bit of a movie, I actually can watch the movie like a fan. Right. Uh, I only know my 15 minute or 10 minute sequence that I was privy to. So mm-hmm. that that can be that can be nice, you know. So there's definitely a price to pay for knowing, you know. Now I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a simple question. You can say yay or nay. I'm just going to ask it since uh, Rogue One had a bunch of behind the scenes. We can call it drama. Um, there was some amazing footage shot and shown in those trailers. Um, do you have any insight on what was going on back there or anything like that? And you can easily just say, Alex, I can't talk about it. Well, it, there's nothing for me to say. I was brought in. I and mean, one of the reasons I got my big ILM break, I think, mm-hmm. and I'm, and I am kind of partially guessing here was because of the reshoots, because of the changes made to the film, the VFX deadline got pushed. They needed um, help to finish the movie on time to make its um, December release. And, you know, that's how I got in the door. It's hard to get that first job with ILM, or at least it was for me anyway. I mean, I, I think it was my, I want to say my sixth try, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that was, a, and that was the try that you told them that you worked with me on broken, obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's what yeah. opened the door. Got it. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I had been trying to get an ILM for years. So, you know, um, this was finally the moment and, and a Star Wars film and six weeks and, you know, San Francisco home base. It was it was just amazing. I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's incredible. So I um, so, yeah, so I got out there and I thought, well, what is it going to be? And there was no disorganization. It was it was wonderful behind the scenes. I felt and, you know, and I felt like the media was blowing it out of proportion. Personally, to me, it really was. And maybe it's just the professionalism and the the level of skill that Lucasfilm has, but it, all the work was was spot on. It, there was no rush, and we were doing a lot of work on a short deadline, but there was no panic. It was all done very well. Uh, the director Gareth Edwards was there with us, working with us. He was friendly. Um, my VFX supervisor was John Knoll, who w- was amazing. Is like working with a rock star. Um, he um, was friendly and and calm and and everything just worked like a well-oiled machine it was just so smooth i was blown away i've i've done a lot of vfx work for a lot of films and i've seen some pretty stressful situations oh yes and, <laughs> and you've been and, part of some <laughs> and rogue one was not that it was it was completely smooth so i think the stories 
of the changes and you know it got a little blown out of proportion i think the changes that were made made the film considerably better mm -hmm. i don't think that there's ever going to be a cut with the extended footage that's going to somehow magically be you know something different i think what they went with was immensely better i think everybody was on board and there you know and it was just it 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 came out great mm -hmm. so i have a lot of faith in in Lucasfilm and Kathleen Kennedy and, and everybody, I, I think they just do great work. And I, and I trust them when they make changes to films and what they do. A lot of people are like, oh, it's the Disney influence or, oh, we're trying to m reach a certain audience. But I, I honestly think that they just want to make the best film possible. And they have the money and the resources and the time and they care enough to actually do it. So I'm a little less cynical. Having worked there, I'm actually – I'm I'm more of a fan of of Lucasfilm and Disney in general about the way they do things than than I was before. I mean, I'll tell you what. I mean, if if, if Rogue One is them trying to hit a complete mass market, um, that's not the way. That's definitely not it because it's one of the darkest uh, installments inside the Star <laughs> Wars universe, without question. I've yet to show it to my daughters purely <laughs> because there are some questions I'm going to have to answer afterwards. So I'm just going to leave that be. Uh, even though they have the toys from Rogue One, um, they don't. They, I haven't shown it to them because it's pretty darn dark. Actually, arguably darker than Empire, which is one of the darkest, uh, darkest uh, installments as well. Now, you said you worked with John Knoll, and for people, for the audience, uh, you know, the guys listening, John Knoll is a legend. Uh, he's up there with Dennis Murin as one of the you know guys at ILM who are are, are just legends, but. John Knoll specifically was, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me. He was one of the original developers of Photoshop as well. Yeah, him and his brother um, <laughs> developed Photoshop, Thomas Knoll, which is the name you usually see when you load up Photoshop. But he was one of the original developers as well. Yeah, he co-created Photoshop. That's insane. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Insane. And you know, it was right around his time at the beginning of his ILM tenure. You know, and and. Um, you know, when he was working on the abyss around that era, around yeah. the you know, early nineties and, uh, 89, 90, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this was just, uh, the start of it. Everything amazing that's happened, you know, it seems like it all started at ILM, you know, it really did. I mean, places like Weta and MPC and other places I've worked at, they've, they've, a continued legacy, but it, it, it all started with ILM. Oh yeah. They were the, they were the, the big bang, if you will. Uh, of the uh, visual effects industry without question. And John Will was specifically your VFX supervisor. So you were working with John on a daily basis, or, or, correct? Yes. I mean, you know, when you go into the screening room, he's, he's the person giving you notes and that's uh, that takes a little getting used to when you're coming in the first time, you know, I mean, I mean, some people I guess would be kind of unfazed, but if you know about the business or the history I mean, it, it can be kind of a, a really uh, intimidating thing. And, but there is, He's such a cool guy that there was there was no reason to be nervous or anything. It's just um, you know just another day at 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 work there. You know that's the crazy thing. Now, can you talk a little bit about that process? What is the screening process? What is what it like notes? Can you talk about that so the audience understands? Yeah, you know, um, VFX studios tend to run the same way. ILM, Weta, you know, MPC, Digital Domain, all the places I've been, you know, they tend to to have the same kind of workflow. You know, mm -hmm. you're assigned shots. Um, you know, they have some kind of shot organizing system, like a shotgun. That's a very common, common one. Um, you get assignments, you see the other people who are working on your shots and those assignments. So you're working with other artists at ILM. You, there's a lot of interaction with the other artists in the departments. There's a lot of teamwork. There's, there's a lot of communication. You're talking to the other people working on your shot. Uh, meaning CG artists or roto prep artists or, um, you know, dynamics, anybody, you know, you're getting a lot more input from those people directly. So where at other studios, sometimes there's a little more, it's already done by the time you get to it, do your part and send it along, you know, next person in the assembly line. So it was a lot of um, teamwork at ILM that I really enjoyed, but it took a little getting used to. Um, and then on a daily basis, you, you do your work and almost at every VFX studio, you have dailies. You have daily dailies where you look at your shot. Now, when you get close to the deadline, you usually have morning dailies and, and afternoon dailies. And then when you're really getting close to the end of the project, you have like uh, 10 o'clock at night evening dailies. So you have like morning, <laughs> mid-afternoon and evening dailies. And 
And the problem with too many daily sessions usually is uh, you get notes, but then you don't have a tough time to address those notes before the next daily session. And then your shot's not in the next daily sh- session. And then they're like, where is the shot? And the coordinators are, are contacting you to try to, to find out where you are. Mm-hmm. But that's generally the workflow. It's uh, you're sitting at your desk, you're working, you, you're using your, your shot management system to understand where you are in the process. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You're doing your work. You're listening to your headphones. Um, you know, your, your shot comes up and you, you sub, when you think, ah, you know what? I like this work I'm doing. Let me, uh, let me submit it in so my soups can look at it and give me some direction. You know, you, uh, you, you create a stopping point. You submit your shot into dailies. You keep working, and then at some point you're alerted, hey, dailies are going on. Your shot's going to be viewed by um, your supervisor. Come on in, and then you go into the dailies room and uh, and view the shots. And uh, that's pretty much – and then you get more notes, and you rinse and repeat until they say, all right, I think this is good enough for another supervisor or the director to see it. We're going to submit it to the director, and then you get those director notes, or the director says, awesome, and then on your way you go, and you're on to the next shot. So that's – that's pretty much, you know, the, your your daily life as a VFX artist. Now, how many? And I, I know this is a long question, but how many departments are on a, on a typical shot? Like, because you're 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 comp, if I'm not mistaken, correct? I am comp. I am the end end of the line. I'm the last one to do, you know, a shot. I'm the one who assembles all the pieces together from the different departments to create the final shot that's in the film. The only thing that may be done after me is uh, color grading, mm-hmm. you know, um, and you know, and certain editing. Um, for the most part though, what you see on the screen is what left my computer, which is the cool thing, Mm -hmm. but uh, given to me, you know, there's animators, there's a layout, which, you know, a layout creates, uh, you know, the, the tracking for a scene and, uh, the general, the framework of the scene and make sure all the measurements are correct. And, uh, you know, everything is, uh, you know, properly blocked out and then, animation you know if you have cg creatures or cg vehicles the animation just like an animated movie that's where you get that Mm -hmm. and then you have like lighting where they do all the texturing and lighting to make it look real so what i receive should already look very good and and when you're at a studio like ilm and weta the stuff is just beautiful Mm -hmm. and you're almost like wow what am i doing here i mean because this (laughs) already looks great and it's my job to give it that little extra bit that little extra icing to make it, I mean, some shots are different than others. I mean, some shots need work. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, some shots, you know, require a lot um, on the compositor to make them go across the finish line. If you can fix something in comp without sending it back to other departments, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you um, can, if you have the time and you have the resources, it's better to send it back to the individual departments to be done right, and then back to me to just put in the final shot and move along. Um, you're also, but what, how many departments on a shot depends on what the shot involves. Sure. Um, so if it's just, you know, background placement with green screen, maybe you don't need animation. Maybe you don't need lighting. You just get DMP digital matte painting department gives you a matte painting and you're keying it in and compositing and boom, you're good to go. And then it's done. And then other times you have a shots with, uh, you know, uh, effects, simula- simula- VFX simula- uh, simulation, mm-hmm. like uh, smoke and rain or tornadoes or, or things like that, or you, you know, and you have animation and you have digital matte painting and you have, you know, like everything you can, I've had shots with, with everything, you know, and those are the ones that take a while. Mm-hmm. And sometimes as a compositor, you're just waiting for those elements to get to you and they'll give you other shots to do in the meantime, but you're just waiting for those things to hit. And, um, and you know, that's, that's the process. That's, that's the magic that, no. that creates these films nowadays that all have so much of this done on everything you look at. Now, what's, where's the rendering done? Are you doing the rendering on your workstation? Cause some of these shots will take days depending on how complex it is. <laughs> Well, sometimes your workstation is part of the render farm, a chain of computers that's doing the actual rendering. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually you don't have it on your – you don't render locally on your own okay. station. You're sending it to the farm. And these big VFX studios have these massive farms that can do amazing amount of you know, computational um, you know, processing you know, that can really churn these shots out. But, of course, there's an old adage of you – know, 
oh, when we can render faster, this will all go quicker. But it never does because the faster we can render, the more complex we make the shots and the render time stays about the same. So we always tend to be just moving the finish line. We never cross the finish line sooner. We just keep moving the finish line out so it takes the same amount of time. We're just covering a greater distance. You remember when SD was like a a pig to render? Yeah. Just doing like standard – like the stuff we did together 12 years ago. Uh, it took forever to render. Now, <laughs> literally, you can render that on your iPhone. Um, yeah. But we're not doing that anymore. Now we're in 4K. <laughs> yeah. So now we, you know. Sometimes wrongly so. Don't get me started on whether you need to be in 4K or not. But Yes, uh, please. Uh, preach, brother. Preach. Yeah, God. I mean, for most projects, 4K is overkill. 2K is more than enough. And sometimes HD is more than enough, quite honestly. Um, but 2K is a nice resolution. 4K is just overkill unless you have a shot that specifically demands the extra detail, like moving a far distance in a shot. I remember on The Hobbit, we had a scene where, you know, Bilbo is in this giant cavernous uh, dungeon in, in, in the mountain. And and this camera comes from way out, down the hall and out and it zooms all the way by him on his face. And, you know, you need I think we did that plate in 6K. I can't remember. Mm. It was crazy. But you need the detail on a shot like that. And churning that in stereo in 40 frames a second, 42 frames a second or whatever, it, it was just unbelievable. You know, it was, uh, you know, you got to have the best computers in the world to 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 churn that kind of, uh, you know, those kind of shots around, you know? And that's the thing. I, and, and please, I want you to, I, I want, I want you to tell the audience from your perspective as a VFX artist, 4k and dealing with 4k plates and dealing with 4k workflow because there's so many independent filmmakers out there who come to me they're like oh i want to color grade in 4k i want to master in 4k and i'm like why why do you want to do that and it's like vfx heavy and these poor vfx artists say yeah i'll do it if, if but they like well they just can't get it done because it's just too much rendering it's too much bandwidth to push yeah. all of that especially if you got a thousand shots or 500 shots it's too much if you got one shot two shots fine um and if you're guardians of the galaxy you want to shoot 8k on the new red absolutely go for it you guys have the resources to do that but from a vfx perspective what's your feeling i feel like it just adds more time and f you know it just makes things slower and it just it stresses the computer out and depending on the um, you know the resources you have to render, if you have a big farm and you don't mind the renders taking hours and hours and hours, even with the farm, mm-hmm. I guess it's all good as long as it's not slowing you down. But it in in the indie world, it slows you down way too much to be useful. I mean, you you'd rather be moving quicker and getting more versions of a shot than waiting longer to see each version. It's it's just very wasteful. It, it's it's just not necessary. I mean. You know, to quite honestly, you know, 1080p actually blows up wonderfully. It does. Now, I, I don't know if there is a secret, okay, because I'm not privy to everything, okay? I did a Game of Thrones episode, um, you know, Watchers on the Wall in season four. Mm-hmm. Those episodes were in 1080p because they're for HBO, for your TV, and they are beautiful. Well, they had, before season five um, happened – they did a special IMAX yeah, showing right. of episodes nine and ten. The one I worked on was episode nine of season four, and so I go to an IMAX theater to see my work blown no, up to IMAX. No, they didn't. And it's gorgeous. Ten eighty p blow up. Ten eighty p blown up to IMAX, and it's perfect. It's beautiful. I mean, it's not as ultra crisp and ultra sharp as if it was shot with an IMAX camera. But I was never once super aware of the conversion. And I enjoyed it so much seeing that episode on, in IMAX. And, and I, I just, it got me to thinking though, if this can be done, if you can take 1080p footage and make it really nice in IMAX, then what are we doing? <laughs> Why are we spending all this time? Now I've been to a, you know, a, you know, an electronic store and I've seen 4k displays doing 4k footage of like skydiving and stuff and cityscapes. And you see sure. all this little tiny Chris, detail. Yeah. And I think that's amazing, but I've never seen that kind of detail in a film, and I've never seen that kind of detail in normal, you know, projects. Now maybe we'll get there, but that's just not something that I see very much, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, and, it, go ahead. You know, even when you see a 4K restoration, say Ghostbusters, and you see it projected at 4K, you're like, okay, this is great. They went back to the original film, and they, you know, and, and it's 4K. But is there that much? 
improvement. Now, a- HD was a big jump. And but if you really look at the 2K to HD gap, it's so minor that you're like, are we really getting our money's worth? And then when you look at the 4K jump, now I've watched like Netflix shows like Daredevil and Jessica Jones at 4K. And I admit, I see the extra detail and I enjoy it. I mm-hmm. really do. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I just don't know, though, that it isn't always worth it. It depends on the project. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I think that if your pipe's set up for it, more power to you. Um, but if you are not absolutely set up for it, it is not needed. And there's not many places that are set up for it. <laughs> no, there really, there really isn't. You know, there just really isn't. I mean, ILM, Weta, NPC, those guys, they're, they're set up for it. But they have an insane amount of infrastructure to be able to push that. So like if I hired you, Dan, for a VFX shot on uh, like 10 VFX shots on an indie film – and they're all 4K. That you'd be just like, what are you doing, Alex? <laughs> and, I'd be, I'd be, and then I would probably try to charge you double or triple for it. Because, that's but that's the same thing <laughs> I do when someone comes to me. They're like, we want a master in 4K. I'm like, well, it's going to cost you another 15, 20 grand. Sorry, right. it because it's going to take so much longer to process it, to deal with it, to render it out, to master it. It just adds a level of stupidity. Uh, on a film that uh, that is not going to be projected ever in 4K, generally speaking. I know a lot of people listening now. Now we've gone off a tangent here for a second. Um, <laughs> but I know a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, 4K, you know, pro- future proofing. I'm like, come on. I, I mean, you can't, you can't future proof everything. I mean, we could be, you know, uh, watching holographic uh, projections yes. of old films someday. And, you know, and, and there's conversion process, the same way we turn, you know, uh, flat films into 2D in, into 3D projected films. You know, mm-hmm. we it can be done, and and there will be ways to convert old material. There always will be. If it's worth saving, it'll be saved. It's it, it's just it's it's just it's just not very um, it's just not very time smart to try to to push that higher resolution. We've jumped too fast too. I mean, if you look at how long it took us to do the HD jump mm-hmm. from SD oh, in yeah. the production world, sure. Why are we why are we jumping, you know, past 2K all the way to 4K and, you know, people talking about 8K televisions coming down the pipe someday? I'm like, why? We're moving too fast for no reason whatsoever. You know, it's it's because I think the we got to sell electronics. We got Well, that's sell the thing. Like now they, now it's yeah, uh, now it's UHD, HD. Ultra yeah. HD, which is the color space change and and I get and I see that and I see what the process is for the uh, Ultra HD. Um but yeah, you're right. They just have to constantly be selling the new thing. So it's a curved television or it's this or it's that. or Yeah. Now, high dynamic range, I think that's pretty cool because, you know, we, we've been working in high dynamic range. When you're working on raw, you know, mm-hmm. DPX files or, or EXR files, mm-hmm. you know, like raw film, you know, raw digital that has high dynamic range. In the VFX world, we have to do that because we need – to see detail in the brightest brights and the darkest darks. So being able to manipulate that in the VFX process is important. So the fact that that range is starting to be preserved all the way to the final product is exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's you know? and I and as a colorist, it, it's invaluable. Uh, that's why I always like editing or color grading in RAW. Uh, so uh, no, we've we've gone off on a tangent, Dan. As we, no, I, I don't I, think so. I, I, it's kind I, of interesting. It is very interesting. <laughs> hopefully, uh, for everyone listening. But let's get into the Last Jedi. And, uh, and, and you work on it <laughs> and you work, I'm sorry, as much as we can, <laughs> as much as we can, uh, contractually. Um, yes. so how long was the post-production process? I know you weren't there the entire time, obviously, but what is a, a typical post schedule for a film of that magnitude? Boy, that that's all over the place. You couldn't really answer that. I, I think ideally it's somewhere around six months. Okay. I think that would probably be a sweet spot, but certain films take more time Certain films take less time. You know, we mm-hmm. we knocked out uh, X Men Apocalypse. I think in in roughly three months, maybe four months. I mean, most of the work, the bulk of the work, is done in three or four months. But you have, th- but they had an insane sized team at that point. Yeah, they do. You know, we had ninety compositors on our team. You know? So <laughs> yeah. it was, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of churning, a lot of a lot of movement. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and. It, it it really just depends on what the production decides on. And the longer you have to tweak, you know, the better, I guess, you know. So 
Um, I want to say it was, uh, you know, and I'm guessing because I was on the last Jedi for three months and it was still going on when I left. I think it was three or four weeks away from wrapping. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, that's a pretty it, long stretch for, um, for a film for you to be yeah. away on a film. But well, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, usually I, I tend to, you know, and if, um, anybody who knows me knows I, I, I like to spend less time on the road mm-hmm. living out of hotels. So I, I try to keep my contracts three months and under. So I usually come in for crunch. I usually come in at the end. Like I was on Rogue one for six weeks. Um, you know, it was kind of my tryout with ILM. I think this to, to get to know me. And then they brought me back luckily, gratefully for, for last Jedi. And that was longer at nearly three months, one week short of it. And, um, you know, and I got to do a lot more on Last Jedi, and it was uh, it was an amazing experience. And uh, and w- what was different about it was working so far out from release. So you know, I finished in June, and the movie's coming out a week from now. And it was a long time to have it in my head and never be able to talk about it. That was a new experience for me, uh, having that inside me for so long and not being able to say a peep, you know, not a word. So that was different. Now with um. What was it like working with Ryan Johnson? Because he seems like an uh, just a wonderful energy, <clears throat> if you will, to work with. Just a very calm dude. Uh, what is it like really work with him on behind the scenes? Well, he, you know, to be perfectly honest, he he was only at, uh, unlike Rogue One, where Gareth Edwards was seemed to be at ILM every day with us. Um, Ryan Johnson was, um, I think, he was down in L.A. I think he was in your neck of the woods. Um, so he would he would video remote in. And, and look at our shots every day, which we all got to see as artists. So that's when we kind of worked with him remotely in that sense, he did come up and sit with us on a few occasions and we got to, you got the in-person uh, critique, but you know what, in person and, uh, you know, through the, the video conference that we would watch the shots, uh, he's just the nicest guy. And so even tempered and, and, and just, just seems like a really genuinely great guy and I, I'm so happy he's doing a new trilogy, you yeah. know, you know, cause he's just, he's got the perfect temperament for it. He's, he's just, he just seems like the kind of guy you want to trust, you know, and, and he's not too high, not too low, but he's excited about what he's doing and he's excited about, um, you know, what he's looking at and the work that we're doing. And it's such a thrill when you're watching, when you're listening to the director, look at your shots Mm-hmm. And, and they're, and they like, Oh, perfect. Great. Or, Oh, I, I kind of like, you learn so much about a director listening to a day after day after day, mm-hmm. you learn about what they like, what they don't like, what their little hangups are, what, what, what their personal preferences are. Every director is different and you have to restyle your, your, you know, what you're doing, you know, for the director. That's why it's the director's film, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, they're the ones calling all the shots on, uh, even on the VFX process, I don't think a lot of people know how involved the director really is. I mean, they're there making every little pixel decision with the VFX supervisor, you know, and, and, you know, they're the last word. They're the one telling you this will fly. This won't fly. We need more smoke here. We need more lasers here. We need a better sky here. We need, you know, can we, so get, you get, can we get a Yoda here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and Ryan, had to be one of the nicest directors that I've ever just had the just had the privilege of, of working around. He was just a uh, just a really nice guy and just uh, just you know really uh, earnest and uh, and trying to do the best job. And he took it so seriously and uh, at the same time kept it light. And you and that you cannot put a price on a good working environment. Just a good happy working environment. My two shows at ILM, the people have been great. My, uh, my, you know, that it's not always like that. Uh, I've been on a lot of films where it was high stress, high pressure, Mm -hmm. uh, arguing, fighting, angry. Um, and my, both of my experiences at ILM, everybody has just been so professional and so laid back. It's like, uh, that's the only way I want to work from now on. To me, it's, it's just not worth it. If you're working these long hours, these 12 and 14 hour days and people are, you know, yelling or, or, you know, or, or abusing you or abusing yelling, you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to put in these hours and sacrifice what we do, the least we can have is a fun working environment because at the end of the day, it should be fun. We're not curing cancer. We're, we're, you know, making fantasy movies, you know, I mean, we're, we're making, you know, dreams and, and then that should be a fun process. Cause I feel like if it's, if it's not a, a fun process, it's going to, 
taint the end product in a way, mm-hmm. you know, and you kind of see that in a, in a lot of productions. And, you know, there is the, the, uh, the other way of thinking though, the whiplash way of thinking a movie I particularly love. If anybody's mm-hmm. out there, see, you know what I'm talking about sure. that you got to have tension and stress and be pushed to your limits to truly make great art. And, you know, there's a small part of me that believes that too. Mm-hmm. It's just, um, I think it's the, it's just in the maestro. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, the maestro, the guy holding the baton, the guy that's, that's setting that tone and bringing the best out in you, they've got to know what they're doing. I can take the abuse if it's done in the right way. Um, and I think uh, there's something to be said for both ways. But if I had to choose, and I think anybody would choose, you prefer being happy all day in your working environment rather than being pushed to the point where you want to throw a desk. And I think I've pushed you in both ways, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been in a very wonderful working environment, and sometimes you wanted to throw a desk at me. Um, <laughs> never on my projects, though. On, when you and I work together on, like, uh, on projects that I create and we kind of work together on – We've rarely had any bumps of heads, but only when I bring in clients. Clients. <laughs> yeah, it's the old clerk's adage, you know, this job would be great if it wasn't for the customers. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it really is that, you know. I think uh, everything we do um, would be better if we were just calling our own shots and making our own stuff and uh, just doing what we want. But uh, as soon as there's a client involved, you know, you are at the service of the client and, and that's always going to push you in places that you don't know, necessarily enjoy going. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I remember even back when I used to do graphic design, you know, it was like, uh, you give a client three versions of something, mm-hmm. never give them something you don't like because the, invariably they will pick <laughs> that one. <you laughs> exactly. Know? And then you're stuck working on the one you hate, you know? Now what, uh, can you tell me any stories or discuss anything about the last Jedi without giving away anything or them suing you? <laughs> that's, that's the tricky thing, isn't it? I, you know, I think just in the I making of behind the scenes, the funniest part. thing in general, and I don't think I'm spoiling anything or, or breaking any NDAs is, you know, the Porg. Yes. You know, from, the, from the day I got to the studio, the Porg were a hot topic. Okay. Really- so, so everybody, if, so if anyone who's not seen the trailer, uh, you have to watch the trailer for the last Jedi and there'll be this little adorable character, <laughs> um, screaming. And, and now there's toys at target and then toys <laughs> are us. Cause I've seen them with my daughters and they're like, Oh, what's that? I'm like, I don't know, but it scares me. Cause it's, <laughs> it's, it's adorable. I think it's cute, but it could turn into a Jar Jar. It could go Ewok. Just don't, just don't beat it after midnight. That's all. Exactly. Like it could go into the, what, you know, the big, big critique of Jedi was the Ewoks was just to sell more toys and stuffed animals. Um, it smells a little of that, but please tell me from your perspective. <laughs> Well, I think that's the core of the argument. I think uh, from the artists who were at uh, ILM who remember Jedi, who grew up on Jedi, or the ones that actually worked on Jedi that are there, I mean, it, it goes back to that whole, was George right, that, uh, you know, you got to have the flavor for the kids. I mean, these movies are made for, for all ages. Yeah, they're for, they're, you know, it's not, when one part of the audience claims ownership over something and says, I got to have it dark, and everything has to be like Empire, and I want everything angry you know, I think you mean like DC. Sorry. Yeah, I mean you're, you're being that that militant fanboy that that just wants it the way they want it, and nothing else is good enough. And I think you're you're missing the casual audience and a whole subsection of people. We don't tend to think about what kids would enjoy, and you've got to do that when you're making movies. They deserve part of the film as well. Star Wars is not supposed to be seven. It's not supposed to be this dark and depressing world that doesn't have any hope. I mean. When you were, you know, watching, you know, Batman versus Superman, one of the biggest things is, man, this is joyless. It's so, oh, angry, you know, so and, angry. and that's, uh, you know, and that's, oh, and some people like it though. Some people are like, yeah, that's setting us them apart from Marvel and it's, it's, it's darker. And I think Star Wars always will have a fun kid part to it. And we as fans have to come to grips with that. And, and I think the Porg are fine, but of course, when I was in the studio, you know, that some of the artists are like, I hate these little rats with wings. And, you know, and other artists are like, they're adorable. I love them. I want stuff pork all over my desk. So, you know, <laughs> they're diver- they were diverse from, you know, the it's a, deci- a divisive um, 
subject from the get go when I got there. Sure. And when I saw them, I'm like, what's going on with these things? You know, um, and now they're out in the world and, and already the conversations begin. People are like, Oh, they're awesome. You know, when it's, it's yelling just like Chewbacca in the trailer, Arr! you know, right, right. And there's another little TV spot out right now where Chewbacca is like brushing the porg off the console and knocking it down. Uh-huh. And there's a whole bunch of people going, Oh, finally Chewbacca's throwing the porg to the ground, you know? <laughs> um, you but know, that's I genius. Knew- but that's genius because it's creating conversation. It's creating uh, even the, the small amount of controversy within the fan base. It is getting people talking. Not that you need a whole lot of people to more talking about the, the no. movie, but it is. It is. It's a good way to kind of get them going, get them revved up. Yeah, it, it definitely was the thing. It was the thing we talked about most. I think uh, you know the porg, and, and it was the kind of inside joke. And and I think Ryan. You know, I think he knew that, you know, I think everybody because he created that. it, right? He created. Yeah. It. I mean, I think they they saw these from what I've read, because I, I don't I don't know. Sometimes I'm just like you guys. I, I have to read this stuff mm-hmm. from fan sites. I believe they saw some uh, birds that were on that island where, where um, you know, that they were on at the end of Force Awakens. And, and it gave them this idea. We should have the, the Star Wars equivalent of this bird in the movie, you know, and and, you know, it's just a little flourish. It's not crucial to the film it's just something that's it's going to annoy some people and there's some people that are going to like to flourish but it's i don't think in the end it will ruin your appreciation the poor spoiler the poor don't rise up and overtake the first order <laughs> you know so, though like, i don't it's not going to be think, like the ewoks it's not going to be yeah, like the ewoks. it's not going to be the ewoks part two it really can't be because that's where the ewoks went wrong is that the ewoks were you know taking out stormtroopers and people can't deal with that but um <laughs> It's just hilarious no, I don't that this is a conversation. <laughs> the poor, the poor are not. I don't think quite suited to do that. So I don't think we're ever going to get to that point. And, and one of know, the cast, and, and one of the cast members came out publicly and says, "I hate them." Yeah, yeah. John Boyega, said <laughs> John Boyega, yeah. just like <laughs> I hate them. I hate them. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what they're doing. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> The good thing is it's it's not a major part of the film, so they shouldn't you know ruin or or uh, enhance you know any part of the film. They're they're just kind of there, and I think they can only enhance. I don't think they can ruin. I should say. I no. think they can only be there if you like them. Uh, but uh, if you don't like them, I don't think they're going to really get in your way of enjoying this installment of the Star Wars saga. And, you know. And did you uh, did you work on any shots with him? With Porg in it? No, no. I, I had no Porg shots. Um, <laughs> You know, I was I was not gifted with those shots, but um, I can say that I did have uh, shots with uh, the crystal foxes, which which you've seen in the trailer yes. as well. Yes, those were those were I thought really cool. I can't even you imagine know? what they, they they just look insanely cool. Yeah, they are amazing, and uh, working on those was a lot of fun. And you and, and you also had a, a Luke shot, if I'm not mistaken. I did get to work on shots that contain Luke Skywalker, but uh, nothing, you know nothing, that's all I can say about that's that. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. <laughs> that's all we're going to say. That's There's no ILM. There's no reason, Lucasfilm, no reason to, to sue no. Dan. He has nope. not said anything that's not been laid out in the trailers. We all know yep. it's on the poster. Luke is in the movie. That's all we know. And when you when you sign NDAs, that's pretty much your guideline. You look at what they release in the world, yes. and you know you can talk about something that's on a poster or in the trailer, or you know, as long as you're not saying anything about it that shouldn't be public knowledge. But you know, to 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 just the young please. VFX artists out there, I would say the better thing to do is just not say anything. Don't do what I'm doing right now. Don't even <laughs> dance around the edge. Just yeah, kind don't, of don't go don't on a podcast. <laughs> don't go on Alex's podcast and talk about what you do behind the scenes. Because I guess. If I right now, if I burn my bridges and nobody wants to hire me ever again, I could at least be, take solace in the fact that I made it to ILM and I got to work on Star Wars. And you know, <laughs> I think you know. I think you're safe. But yes, don't do yeah. this. If you sign, and I, <laughs> do not do what you're doing here. But I don't think you've done anything wrong, sir. Uh, no, I'm being very I, careful. Yes, of course, of course. But yeah, but you've you've got some history with this as well. So uh, for young VFX artists, Dan's been around a little bit. So that's yeah. why, and he's also he knows I'm not going to give him any gotcha questions. Uh, oh, and I and, and back when I was at Digital Domain, you couldn't speak with any form of media um, without going to the public relations department, you know, because wow. I was a full time staff member of Digital Domain. So, you know, there was no publicly talking about anything regarding the studio. They kept a tight grip on it, you know, and I and mostly um, I don't think the studios are too worried about it. Generally, Digital Domain was, but in, since then, I've noticed the studios. 
know that if you were to break your NDA, you're just costing yourself your career. So people are pretty good about not talking about what they work on, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's really easy not to talk when you know you won't get another job if you talk about it. So right, exactly. it's not a hard rule to really maintain because um, the tricky part is here's the hardest part. If, if you have a family or if you have a home and they start asking you and you're so oh, tempted, that's so brutal. You're so tempted to share with everybody in your family and you can't even do that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Because you know, because you don't know where they're going to to spread it, you know? and it'll so, get back, and it'll get back to you. Exactly. That's so why that's, I've never even yeah. asked, nor would I want to, because you'd be ruining the fun. So, uh, I, yeah, you just don't ask things like that of 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 the insiders, as they say. <laughs> no, I mean, and it, it's a little bit of a burden to carry, but I'm not going to complain because there are far worse jobs to have. I mean, it it. It does make you a little nervous sometimes, and, and most of the time when you get a new VFX job, on day one, you're sitting there watching a video that tells you about not saying anything, uh, you know, about anything that you're talking or doing about, you know, just the best practices is just shut up and pretend you don't even exist, just you know? The best practices is just be cool. I, I, I tell you, for me, though, it's, it's hilarious to go to film websites and watch the rumors spread and see things <laughs> and know what's real and what isn't and just laugh at people and, and, and just kind of say, oh, you're so far off. Or, oh, hey, you got it, but I'll never tell you you got it. Or, you know, <laughs> um, it's weird to, to see, to know that and to watch people speculate. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. You know, that's, that's why I wanted to do this, right? So that I have so that I could be a part of this process and, and to sure, know it sure. from the other side. And, uh, or as Kevin Smith would say, know how the sausage is made. That's what, you know, I know yes. how the sausage is made. Yes, exactly. So now, Dan, when you went down, because I've no, I basically was at the beginning of your VFX career. Um, and, uh, you know, you always told me that there was kind of like four movies, three specifically, but then a fourth one came up as that, that uh, genre popped up was you wanted to make a Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. You wanted to make a James Bond movie. You mm -hmm. wanted to make an X-Men movie. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you're like, I wouldn't mind making a Marvel movie. Yep. Um, and you've done all of that. And even when you did Rogue One, you were like, oh, but it's not an original trilogy. It's, <laughs> it's just so – and I'm like, shut up, Dad. I'm like, I'm like oh, but – I really want to do one of the, I want to do one with Luke Skywalker in it. and then boom, you get last Jedi. So I have to ask you, brother, what, what's next? Are you just, are you done? Are you just going to check out? Well, <laughs> cause you're been... one of the few artists uh, that I most know, You're one of the few people in the business that I know that has achieved their goals in the, many the, the ways. Checklist? I've actually, I've checked the boxes on the checklist. Yeah. I, yeah there's bucket list stuff that you checked off. It was strange. You know, um, I kind of, I had the ability to do it, um, because of my own situation. So not every VFX artist can hop studios the way I do and live in South Florida and, uh, um, can afford themselves the ability to wait for the right contract to come up mm -hmm. to work on the right film that the freedom in this business is having the ability to pick and choose which project you work on. And really step one is build your resume to a certain point where you're desirable Mm -hmm. And then once you've done that, then have enough money and no overhead to be able to sit and wait for your desired project to need somebody of your skill. And then once that happens, you jump on it. And even then you don't always aren't guaranteed of getting it, but you can at least put yourself in a position to be where you want to be, you know? So, um, you know, you used to tell me, you know, if I wanted to get hit by a car, I had to go play in traffic. So yes. I was able to do was I was able to pick and choose my spots of when I jumped into traffic. Mm -hmm. So it was no guarantee the car was going to hit me, but I just jumped into traffic at the right time. And so it was just being uh, at a company that said, Oh, we got the new bond film. And I'm, and I said, you know, I've always wanted to work on those. Could I get on that project please? Mm -hmm. And they said, all right, Dan, sure. We'll put you on that project. And, and so, go. It's just a way, and so that's ended up how it happened to where that I got to do those things. And, you know, as far as what's next, man, I didn't think I would make it this far. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I've been kind of struggling with it a little, and it's a good problem to have. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. It's handcuffs, but golden handcuffs, yes. But it is a little bit like, well, what stimulates me now? 
what because now I'm on the next level tier of difficulty. Now it's like, well, I'd like to work on a Nolan film. I'd like to work on a Fincher film. I'd like to work on a Cameron film. Well, then it's like even more difficult because it's not always common knowledge who's working on what, where. I mean, you pretty much know where Star Wars is going to be worked on. You pretty much know where yeah. Bond is going to be worked on. You know, it's, it's but, hard but, but you're James, looking for but filmmaker. If, right. But if you're going to be on – if you want to go on Avatar, brother, you're, there's like well, four of them. What? Coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a real good chance you're going to get on an avatar if there's a, if you, if, you know, you've got it's at true. least another 10 years. <laughs> it is true. To try and, to get and don't one. be wrong, but it's, it's, it's still a little bit more difficult, but you know, um, overall there's a piece with having done the things that I really wanted to check off. Mm -hmm. And now it's more, now I'm my, my, my cares kind of shift to a different mode. You know, how much money am I earning? How long am I going to be on the road? You know, now I'm, I used to be like, oh, I'll do anything three months and under. Now I'm, I'm changing my tune. Now I'm like, boy, you know, eight weeks feels a lot better than, than three months, mm -hmm. you know, on the road. So, and those chances don't come up, but I, I can honestly tell you what my new priorities are, sure, you know, sure. and my I new Authority is Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, to do Stranger Things in one yeah. way, shape, or form, or Westworld, or because like I've been talking a lot about how TV has become such a fertile, amazing ground where the best work is being done for Netflix and for television for HBO. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did Game of Thrones, so I, I'm, I was very happy about that. That was definitely would have been on my list if I hadn't already done it. Um, so the but, list will know, always just change. The yeah, bucket list is always will. whatever I'm passionate about at the moment. And I think, you know, and I can tell this story now, um, you know, I was home from Last Jedi. I was really worn out. Last Jedi um, took a lot out of me and I was tired and I was ready to spend a long time at home. And uh, Atomic Fiction was looking for people for a, a, a 911 project. We need compositors. Five weeks wouldn't have been. And I'm like, boy, that's right up my alley. That's what I like to do. I like to go do five weeks um, on something. And I just couldn't even bring myself to apply because I was tired and I was ready to stay home. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up talking to Atomic Fiction uh, uh, about a month ago in an interview for another job. And they said, oh, you should have contacted us for that. And I'm like, yeah, what was that job? Oh, that was Stranger Things too. Oh, and son I'm, of a oh, – oh. I was just – I was just like <laughs> – I was like I should have just got on the road. I should have just – should have just sent the email in. I should have – you know. Oh. And so – my career is littered with the could have beens. I think everybody's not, career. Not too many, right? sir. Not too many. No. Of those. <laughs> I mean, just like uh, when I was a digital domain, my team had an opportunity to be a part of Dragon Tattoo. Mm -hmm. And that was a Fincher movie. And that would have checked a box for me. And it, just in the end, my team didn't get to work on the film. So I was so close to it, right next to it. But I didn't get to do it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I had friends that got to do Force Awakens and I didn't. And, uh you know, just decisions where if I turned left or turned right, I could have gotten to do something I didn't get a chance to do. Um, so I have these little regrets. I can't do anything about them. Um, and I think that's kind of normal. And I can't complain because I've gotten to do so much. Every time I talk about what I didn't get to do, people are like, oh, shut up, Dan. Yeah, pretty much that's what I'm saying, Dan. Shut, you shut know, up. Shut, shut, shut up. Shut up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's Look. it's a personal thing. And it, it, it's just like – it's Look. when I, when I do these jobs, I just want to be excited, you know? And, and before rogue one, I was starting to not be excited anymore. I mean, I, I was doing uh, pirates of the Caribbean before rogue one and it, it's not that it was bad. It was fun. It was good. And, um, uh, before that it was X-Men. I was, I was happy, but it was a job and I was start, I've done so many films and it was just starting to feel like a job. But man, when I walked into ILM San Francisco, <laughs> in the, the Mecca, as you call it, and they sat me down at a computer and said, make laser blasts with stormtroopers. And I'm like, I was a little kid again. And my, <laughs> my stomach was churning with butterflies. And yeah, I remember, I, was, I remember you, <laughs> oh, you were you know, calling me. You're like, I don't know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and I'm like, I'm a pro. I've been doing this for years. I've worked on billion dollar films, you know, like sure. I, I have been nervous, but a man that ILM brought it out of me. It, it was like <laughs> being a beginner all over again. And it was an exhilarating. It was making me so excited to come into work and to sit down and, and, you know, like, like, I'm like, this is incredible. I'm, I'm sitting down today and I'm working on spaceships and I'm working sure. on, you know, this movie that has Darth Vader in it. I mean, what, what am I what, doing? What world here? am I in right now? What world am I in? It felt 
like a dream. And that's a cliche too. And I, you know, I, I say that a lot, but it was that hazy unreality kind of feeling, you know, no, I, and, listen, look, dude, I get it completely. And I, and for everyone listening, I, I was with Dan, uh, pretty much since the beginning. Uh, I was his first big, I, I'm assuming I was the first big show you did. Uh, cause yeah. I, yeah, with, with my short broken and, uh, and then we just continued to do work for years. And, Dan and I did a lot of work together doing independent films for years. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Before you got a shot at digital. Six or seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Six or seven years paying your dues, working, doing projects. It's a long time before you got the call up at digital domain. And that honestly happened purely because they had a Florida uh, outpost yes because exactly. you wouldn't have been called to la digital nope. domain it, it just probably wouldn't have ever happened so nope. you right place right time and you had prepared yourself to a certain point and then th- once you were invited once you started you, once you dated one pretty girl all the pretty yeah. girls said okay <laughs> he must be all right if he dated one pretty girl um and, and it's so true you're like you, you nobody wants to be the first of the party and nope. once they once you had digital domain on your and you weren't doing like crazy amazing stuff at digital domain you were you were no, no, brought in as Roto, right? Yeah, well, no, it was um, stereo conversion. Yeah, stereo you conversion, know. Roto, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, it was – yeah, you weren't doing sexy stuff. Nope. <laughs> you, <laughs> Not at all. But I felt – but I had those butterflies when I was at Digital Domain too because it was my first big job. Sure. And I'm looking at the posters of – of uh, you know all the digital domain movies T2 on the wall, and, <laughs> and just yeah, just, and just the idea. Oh, this is the the company that Cameron helped co-found, and and uh, you know Fifth Element and Fight Club and the first X Men and all these movies they have been a part of. Sure. Uh, so you know I felt all that history, even though we were a new studio in Florida. Man, it felt crazy to be a part of that. After no offense, after working with you for seven years, six seven years, it was like <laughs> screw you, wow. sir. Screw yeah. you, sir. <laughs> You well, would you be know, nothing, nothing without me. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> it was just different. You know, it, you just can't replace when you get, when you're in the pros, you know it. When you look around, you, look. you know, you're in the pros. There's no, um, there's no, uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. All of a sudden, you know, this is for real and you're working, you know, at the top and, and it was like, and then the fear creeps in and then you're like, oh, I just want to stay here. I just want to make sure they know I'm worthy to be here. Oh, and yeah. Like at any moment, they're going to walk in and go, who are you? What are you doing here? Security. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I felt like that every day at ILM. Even on, on Last Jedi, my second trip to ILM, I felt like, man, they're going to – they're just going to say, what are you doing here? You know, They're going to figure it out that you really – Yeah, they're going to figure it out. You know, I'm a pretender. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't – you know – you know, and that's just partly the way I'm wired. You know, I'm always, you know, hardest on myself, but I, I just, that's how surreal the whole process was. And, um, and, you know, and I, and I'm always hypercritical of my performance. So it was, it was good though, to get back to a place where I was fighting to just maintain, you know, a certain level, because you can be very complacent when you're working on things that are below your skill level. You can become very, um, you can take for granted the things you know and the things you can do. And this industry with the technology and the changing techniques changes so rapidly and, and quickly that all of a sudden um, you can be yesterday's news, you know, like uh, uh, like the optical compositors who didn't want to learn how to use the computer, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and that they were retired from the film industry because it all went to the computer. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's a hard business to be in as far as staying on the cutting edge. You have to do it. I mean, I think you preach that in your podcasts about learning the new techniques and learning what's available to you and all the things you can do. Um, indie filmmakers today have so much power than, than they had before, you know? No, and, and the thing is also you got to challenge yourself and be around people who challenge you. And that's how I felt the way you felt when you went to digital domain is how I felt when I went to, um, to the to LA. Yeah. I was like, all of a sudden you're like, Oh, Oh, this is, oh, this is the game. Okay. Uh, and you got to challenge yourself and, and you always want to be around people who are better than you and that you can learn from and you can grow with. Because if you're the guy at the top of your group or the top of your you know area, you're the big fish in that small pond, you're never going to grow. You've got no, to go. You, you reach your maximum size when you're the big fish. You, you don't ever get to 
You don't, you know, and that's okay. If you want to be the big fish in the small pond, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Yeah. But there's but, always, a, there's always a shark that's learning more somewhere else and yeah. shows up and it'll eat you alive. <laughs> You know? Well, look, that's going to happen to you sooner or later in life. Sure. Anyway, I think that's just like, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get knocked off the top of the mountain at some point. Um, you know, I think the important thing is to be there and, and to work to get there and always trying to be improving and to stay there as long as you possibly can. If they, if that's what you want to do, if you wake up in the morning and you got the passion, then you keep going. If you do, if you wake up in the morning and you are like, I don't want to do this. Life is too short. Don't do it anymore. Do something else, you know? <laughs> Now, what advice would you give a VFX artist just starting out and trying to break into the business today? Boy, today is it's such it's such a different game nowadays. Um, you know, I think we talked a little bit about this last time. I'm still a big proponent of school, just because it starts with your network. It starts you with uh, those people you need to know. Um, but I'd say be careful what you're getting into. Like, like I think even before you think about, oh, schooling, and then I'm going to go try to get into, say, the MPC Academy and try to become a rotoscoper or painter and get into the business. I think you have to look long and hard about what you want to do because the industry today is is it's being done on foreign soil. I mean, that there's that's there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that either. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's being done in Canada. It's being done in New Zealand. It's being India. done in Australia. Yeah. It's being done in England. These, this is where the majority China, um, and you India, know, right. and India, these are the places the work is being done, the uh, most of it. And, um, the, you know, the dream of, of living in Southern California, your whole career and working in the movie industry is, is not there for VFX artists anymore. Not the way this, the, the, the game is presently set up, you know, um, I would caution anybody who doesn't want to move or anybody who does, who's afraid to travel to jump into the game today. And I would caution anybody who, um, you know, is not down for, you know, the way it works, the living in hotels, being the, un- the instability of it all. The, the fact that uh, today it's Vancouver, tomorrow it could be Montreal is the head place. And then after that, it could be, anywhere that decides they're going to throw a lot of money at the movie industry to make movies where they're making them, um, you know, where they want them to make them. So, um, you know, you have to be down. You got, you know, I say this all the time. You just got to love it. You just got to, movies have got to be it for you. It's got to be what, what, uh, you know, what makes you get out of bed in the morning to do this. Um, you know, I think a lot of people today, I, I still think there's young film fans and young movie passionate people, but I think video games are, are another thing that, that kids today are feeling really passionate about. And there's a lot of the same challenges in the video game business, although mo- uh, you know there's a lot of studios in the United States for that still. Mm-hmm. Um, but the instability is the same, and the hours are the same, and the deadlines are the same. Even more brutal and, uh, from what I hear. Yeah, I mean, I mean Alex, once you reach, uh, reach a certain amount of hours – when you're at 120 hour weeks, I mean, is there really a difference in the brutality? And, you know, really, there is Touché, a point, sir. Touché, sir. There is a point in the brutality, and I and I realized this when I was on Hobbit, where you just become a zombie ghost, numb to the whole thing. So I think there's a threshold point where you just become dead on your feet doing the job, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, and then it's just your body deteriorating from then on until you drop dead, pretty much. You know? Wow, that's. <laughs> If that's not a, an advertisement to jump into the business, I don't know what is. No, sir. But, but I mean that's but that's why the show has got to end. I think longer production cycles are even more dangerous. At least on a movie, you know, you, you got that end finish line, and you're only grinding like that for the last few months usually. But um, you know, video game cycles I've heard of going on for a year, for two years, you know, sure. and those bad hours going on for that long. I mean, there has been some famous cases in the. In the past, like the EA widow, if you look up that story on the internet mm-hmm. about a wife whose whose husband worked at EA and you know never saw him, you know, and the family suffered and everything suffers. So, you know, anybody who wants, you know, wife and kids in the house and the white picket fence, uh, VFX might not be what you're looking for. It's a young person's game, though. You know, twenty uh, year olds might love the idea of world travel, working on gigantic franchise films, and. Uh, and, oh, and long hours and, and excitement, you know, and I think there, you can do that when you're 20, 25, mm-hmm. I think you get older. Um, some of that loses its appeal. I mean, even if you do it, you can only do it for like five, five years, maybe, you know, and then, sure. and then you're kind of done. And then it's like, what does the VFX artist transition out of? What do you do after, you know, and well, direct, obviously, 
Yeah, yeah but <laughs> man, if I had a dime for every VFX artist that wanted to be a filmmaker, I mean, we, they call us, we're all filmmakers in the sense that we're all contributing to, the you process. know, make film, sure, sure. you know, of course. So we're all filmmakers, but I think, um, that some of, some of us grew up, uh, wanting to know how to make the monster, know how to make the laser, know how to make the spaceship. But I would say a greater portion of us just grew up loving films and wanting to be a part of it. And, and a natural progression for that is saying, you know, I want to be a director. I want to make films. I want to produce whatever. Um, that's all of Hollywood. I mean, you know, you don't know anything about it in that in L.A., right? Every waitress, every barista, every every. No, every- there's nothing like that here. There's not every, there's not a laptop in every Starbucks yeah. that has a final draft open working on. Yeah, the there's no. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show scripts lying around everywhere you go you know no you, I'm, you buy a car in la i'm sure the the salesman is trying to sell you a script to go with the car my favorite my favorite thing to do now is to go into when i get into an uber and go so how's the screenplay coming <laughs> and i've had a couple of them turn around how'd you know <laughs> or if i look at them i go how's the audition how'd you know <laughs> yeah that's gotta that's just that is so yeah, that's so LA, that's, but it's so true. That's so LA. So last, it, qu- I understand it. I, I do understand. It. Everybody's got these dreams. I mean, I'm not here to to down that at all. I mean, do you know, you more power do. to you. Absolutely, you got so, you got a dream. You got to work at it, but don't but do it smart. Don't do it yeah. foolishly. You know, and be and, and understand what you're getting into before you get into it and waste ten years of your life. Yeah, um, and you're gonna need some luck. I mean, let's be honest. I oh. mean, it's it's not all about skill and talent. You literally need to just get hit by a car. You need that luck. You need, I mean, you got a well, digital domain at Port St. Lucie was that luck for you. Exactly. You know, exactly. That was my, my random car that hit me out of nowhere, you know, but you were ready when that car yes. hit you. I was prepared. I was bracing myself. I was ready for it to happen. Um, now last question, sir, I need you to rank your top three star Wars films of all time, not including last Jedi. Cause that's against the rules, but every right. other movie, Top Ranking three. Star Wars movies, top three out of out of the ones that exist. Out of all the ones that exist in the canon. <sighs> well, Empire is an easy number one. Okay. Um, you know, Star Wars is probably number two, the original, A New Hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where it gets dicey. I love Parts of Jedi. It's hard. You know, we're of a certain age where we love the originals. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, but there's now Rogue One and Force Awakens in that in that mix as well. We're just going to exclude the, the the prequels that the they they don't make the top three. I still I you know they don't, but I I have a lot to like about the prequel and pe- prequels, too. and I, we could probably do a whole show about what's redeeming about the prequels. There are many and, things redeeming about the prequels. There's Yoda and, fighting in, in in Attack of the Clones. <laughs> First time we ever saw that, that was genius. Um, the action sequence at the end of Revenge of the Sith, awesome. <laughs> Um, the the pod race, great. Um, Darth <laughs> Good Ma- stuff. Darth Maul, I awesome. That. I would argue that the overall story, if you look at it separate from dialogue, separate from <laughs> you know the actual scenes, separate from acting, lighting, uh, composition, the overall story is brilliant. <laughs> I would I would I would go to my grave defending George Lucas on the arc yes. of one through six. Yes, you know, yes. I, I yes. think it, the whole thing is a masterwork as a concept. I just think that, you know, things happened in the actual producing of it that didn't turn out quite as great as we would have liked. But that's easy for us to say. It wasn't our thing. I mean, we made it our thing. We adopted it. Um, but it's his thing. You know, I, you know and to finish your question, I got to go with Jedi for three just because wow. I'm, I'm old and I, and I like the original trilogy. And they'll never replace that part of my heart. They they will never be moved. I do not think. See, I know? would agree with you. I would agree with you on the one and the two, but I would go Rogue One. On, you really? On, That's moved into the three spot. For I you? would move that. I would definitely move that in the three spot because as as on a on a cinematic standpoint, now we're geeking, guys. Sorry, um, mm-hmm. but on a cinematic standpoint, I think Rogue One is a much stronger narrative. It's much stronger film. It also doesn't have the weight of having to be the third part of a movie. Uh, or right. of a trilogy, so there's that going for it. But as a standalone, I think it was great. I think, uh, and I know I might get heat for this. I think Force Awakens is better than Jedi, uh, in in many ways. There are moments of Jedi, but I loved Force Awakens. I loved what J.J. Abrams did uh, with Force Awakens. So that's why I'm so excited about Last Jedi. But 
Rogue One is definitely uh, should have some respect up there in, in the It's close. I think Rogue, it, it's very, very, with me, it's super, super close to Jedi. It's, it's neck and neck right there at the bottom. I almost include it in the original trilogy at this point because of the it way is. it was. Made. It really is. It's so connected. It's so hand in hand. And that Vader scene belongs as a part of the core of Star Wars alone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um I, you know, my defense of Jedi is this. I mean, for me, it's, th you know, three quarters of a perfect movie. The, um, you know, I love the opening sequence at Jabba's Palace. That whole oh. thing to me is perfection. And it's something we may never see again because um, it's kind of risky. You know, it's, I mean, Slave Leia doesn't fly in today's PC world. Can you Even imagine though, Slave you know, Leia today? She she did end up killing Jabba. That's the good point. I mean, it, she's a great, strong female uh, character. Can you imagine Slave Ray? Like, yeah, I, we they would get killed in in the politically correct world of today, which maybe is progress. And I'm not here to to say this is wrong or not. Sure, I'm just saying that you probably couldn't do the beginning of Jedi today. Mm -hmm. And I and I have so much respect for the weirdness of the beginning of Jedi. It is brilliantly weird. And uh, and unusual and different in the third part of a trilogy, and that they, they brought some, they went back to the same planet, but at the same time they brought something completely new. And then I would say toward the end, the space battle is impressive, but we've been there before, so it's a bit of a rehash. The Ewoks, le less said the better. They have their audience. It's not me. <laughs> um, the 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 whole father son. Oh, it's face off oh, with, yes. with the John Williams yes, yes. haunting music yes. and the emperor yes. scared me to death when I was a kid. Yes. That whole thing is perfection to me. It is. You know? And it is you know, it really is. And that's what elevates. So the, so the beginning part and then the, the part at the end with, with, uh, with Luke and Vader, that's what make it rise so high for me. There's still so much top quality work that in an originality level, that's just not, being done a lot today anymore. I mean, that's a, that's a whole separate podcast in and of itself, mm -hmm. right? How much we're lacking this epic original storytelling. And yes, I understand the hero's journey and Kurosawa and he stole from the best and all that, but everyone does. I don't care. You about know, that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's still felt so original. I mean, what's, what's around today. That's an original work that has that level of fandom. Maybe Harry Potter, you know, that's, that's got a, well, that's got a level from, from when it started. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, so it's just not being done a lot. It's a rare thing, and that's why it ended up being such a career goal for me is to be a part of that universe. I mean, it just uh, – even in a very minuscule, tiny way, my name in the credits at the very end where nobody's ever going to see them but me and my family. I mean, it's still there, and it still means something to me, and it's, uh, you know, you know, it's something I, I dan i think that and i said this the last time we did this interview our first interview i still feel that you and i need to do a podcast of just film geek stuff um so <laughs> yeah. everyone in the audience if you guys want to hear a <laughs> podcast with me and dan a series a limited series on me and dan just talking movies uh email ifh submissions at gmail.com <laughs> <laughs> and let us know dan brother it is always a pleasure talking to you every time we talk we talk for hours but uh, i'm gonna cut it off today because people have things to do but thank you again for the inside uh look at uh at your life your career your journey and uh shining a little light uh on the vfx world and specifically star wars so thank you brother it's uh, always great to be on the podcast alex thanks for having me I hope you enjoyed that inside look to Industrial Light and Magic and the behind the scenes of Star Wars The Last Jedi, as well as Rogue One and what it's like to work at a facility like ILM, which is, you know, at the at the end of the day, probably at the top of the uh, the echelon of visual effects companies. They were the first guys to do it. And uh, and I'm so glad and, and I'm proud and happy for Dan uh, for being able to achieve a goal that he's been chasing for uh, over 20 years. So it you know you guys got to work hard and you will get there, but it does take a lot of time, a lot of preparation and a whole lot of luck as well. I already got my ticket bought for Last Jedi for Friday. I cannot wait to go see the next installment of the saga. If you want to listen to the first podcast I did with Dan, which was like basically a VFX masterclass, which is episode six, just go over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash zero zero six or go to our show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 
207, and I'll have that and anything else we talked about in the show notes. Oh, and by the way, if you guys have not checked out the YouTube channel, don't forget to head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube. On Tuesday, we will be releasing the first episode of P.T. Anderson's part of the director series. We're going to go throughout his entire career, breaking everything down up until the Fathom Thread, which has obviously not been released yet. But as soon as that gets done, we'll, we'll update the uh, the series. But every other movie goes into insane detail and uh, you definitely should check that out. So head on over to the YouTube channel. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.